Uh, good day, good time of the day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today we are beginning our second lecture, and that's going to be, again, devoted to planning your classes, to planning your lessons. And today we're going to focus our attention on the design and the staging of your lessons. Okay, so little warming up. Um, you, I'm going to present you four sentences that may summarize your like understanding of a good lesson. So let's look at them. For example, a good lesson is like a film, or a good lesson is like a football match, or you may compare it to a meal, or like a symphony. Well, can you choose one of the metaphors that you like best and explain it? Like, why do you think, for example, that a good lesson is like a film? Okay, take your time. Record your answer, please. Thank you very much. Okay, now you have picked up one metaphor. You have chosen one idea. And you now think about how you can implement this idea. Imagine that you're going to plan a 60-minute lesson on uh, past simple that you're going to teach to an elementary class of adults. How uh, is the metaphor that you have going to influence the way you plan this lesson? I know it's a very general and it's very abstract question, but can you explain how you will implement your concept of a good lesson into a plan? How will this metaphor work in an actual plan? Okay. So please record your answer here. Thank you very much. I hope it was manageable. Okay, let's get going. Now to the first thing, uh, and it is sequencing the stages of your lesson. So we have got a task, um, like we're going to write a story to practice past simple and past continuous. So this is what you're supposed to be doing with your students in the following lesson. Remember the task, you can take a screenshot if you like. Now, let's go to the thing. Well, here comes the procedure of this lesson plan. So this, these are the procedures which constitute this lesson plan, but they are jumbled, they are mixed up. Your task is to put them into, into the correct logical order and then to give each stage a timing so that all these procedures fit within the framework of a 45 minute lesson, all right? So take your time, text me or make me a voice message about in what sequence you will place these procedures. You can just text or tell me the, like, the letters in, in a consequence, in a sequence, and uh, how much time each letter is going to take. Thank you very much. Okay, now let me show you my ideas about this lesson plan. So you can see the first uh, stage. I'm not going to comment on that. Let's look at the second one. I think it's gonna be F. And I believe it's going to take about five minutes. Look, the way I mark uh, the time here is not that it's going to take between six to ten minutes. No, I mean, it's going to uh, start on the sixth minute of the lesson and end up by the tenth minute of the lesson. So and this is the way I really recommend you to time your lesson plans, not uh, by the amount of time the procedure takes, but uh, either with what time of the lesson, what minute of the lesson it starts with, and what minute of the lesson finishes with, or even better, if you know exactly at what time you're going to start your lesson, it's even more advisable to put the like the actual time on the clock that each stage starts and ends up. And it would be easier for you to compare your own pace to what you have planned. So for example, if you know that your lesson starts at 12:30, so it means that like around 1240, you're going to be finishing your second stage. Yeah, I think it's a good second stage because uh, after like uh, talking about favorite stories, it's a good idea to give out a short story that's going to be like that's going to contain the examples of the language and focus, so to say. OK, 
The third stage is going to be D. Uh, after the students got familiar to like the text, which contains the grammar, it's time to clarify the form. Yes, to show the examples, to, to do the board work. And I think this stage will take about seven, eight minutes altogether. Um, yep. Uh, what, what is noticeable here is that the teacher does not completely explain everything, but like part of it is explained and part of it is given uh, uh, to the learner's choice. You know, the learners always have to be alert, always have to be listening so that they would be able to do a follow up activity or uh, like, you know, collaborate with the teacher to compose the rule as in this uh, situation. OK, the fourth stage is B. After the material has been explained it's really important to ask questions so as if you remember we would call them like concept checking questions or ccqs right just to see if everything has been understood correctly so that's gonna be kind of short short sessions gonna take about one two minutes altogether okay the following stage is number five uh, then some drilling comes right after the uh, rule has been incorporated now we're gonna have some drilling and that's going to take like eight, nine minutes altogether. And then we're coming up to the production. So that's stage A. You divide a class into groups and each group makes up a story. So they are implementing the knowledge that they have gained from you in the introduction stage, right? So that's going to take quite some time. So like, you know, six, uh, six seven minutes altogether. Well, in the last stage, uh, it's the follow-up of this speaking production activity, forming new groups, comprising one person from each of the other groups. So they are telling stories to each other and it's gonna be the end of your lesson. So, uh, well, could be one of the longest stages, about nine, 10 minutes altogether. So here it is. Okay, let's get going. Well, this is probably just the better you know, representation of the plan. So you can you can take a screenshot if you like uh, for your own use. Okay, let's get going. Next is like planning decisions. Uh, well, the first thing you could think about is the like interaction patterns that you want to have within your lesson. You know, it's important that your lesson represents a variety of interaction patterns. What are interaction patterns? Look at this top box. They are like, students to text, students to students, students to teacher, students to students again. So this is who the students are interacting with, okay? And we have got a number of activities here. Uh, could you decide which interaction pattern is best for each of the activities? For example, the first one, speaking activity, and the procedure, learners talk about their hobbies and interests in groups. So definitely this interaction pattern is going to be students to students. Okay, you get the idea? Now let's look at the second one. Task checking, report back. Teacher asks the learners what they talked about. Okay, so what interaction pattern do you think is uh, supposed to be used here? Thank you. And this is students to teacher, of course. Next one, reading for gist. Learners read your text quickly to understand the gist and answer questions. What interaction pattern is here? Thank you. Students to text. Checking answers, learners compare answers to reading. Thank you very much. Of course, students to students. Okay, good. Next. Uh, uh, continuing this talk about, you know, interaction patterns. Here we have a task. Have a look at that. Familiarize yourself with the task. You can pause the video. Well, the task, uh, I'm asking you to do here is, uh, can you mm, develop or upgrade this activity so that you could use a larger variety of interaction patterns within this exercise? So what can you do with this task? How can you alter this task in order to incorporate uh, more uh, different sorts of interaction patterns? Think about it. You could draft a little plan and then make me a voice message or text me your ideas. Thank you very much. Okay, 
Now, putting things on paper, here we have uh, a so-called pre-plan. So this is the thing which goes before the main body of your lesson plan. It's called a pre-plan and typically contains the uh, main information about the class that you're going to teach. So that, for example, if a methodologist observing your lesson, uh, he or she can pick up this pre-plan and just quickly understand the context within which you're working, right? And uh, the typical elements of a pre-plan are the ones that you can see here. So their aims, the level of your group, the length of the lesson, the class profile, and some anticipated problems and solutions to this problem. So could you please match the uh, like titles of these pre-plan parts to the actual parts of the pre-plan? So could you, simply speaking, match numbers to letters? Thank you very much. So this is the way it looks. Check yourself, please. If you have any questions concerning this matching, text me. I will gladly answer that. OK, let's get going. As you can see, point number five is anticipated problems and solutions. This is probably the one I would like to concentrate on. As for the aims, we have already talked about the aims. The level, the length of the lesson, and the class profile are the constants. But anticipated problems are always new. They're always, you know, coming up. And, and that's a great idea to think about the problems before you start planning the lesson so that you could foresee them and you could, you could kind of prevent them. Okay, let's get some practice with that. So if we consider that we could, like, you know, divide these problems, anticipated problems, into three categories, like linguistic problems, problems with language and language teaching, organizational problems, class management, you know, this kind of things, and individual problems, the problems that are associated to some individual students that you have within your class. Okay, now let's look at this problem. The learners already know will and may overuse it, like they might want to use will in any situations when they talk about the future, right? Even if will is not appropriate. Um, so what kind of problem do you think it is? Well, thank you. This is a linguistic problem, of course. Well, another one. The pair work exercise requires an even number of learners. For example, pairs, right? Uh, so it's possible that one or more may not attend so that you would have an odd number of students in your class. What sort of problem is that? Organizational, absolutely. Boris, for example, is much stronger than the other learners and tends to answer every question I ask. What kind of problem is that? Thank you. So we could say it is an individual problem because it relates to one student in your class, to Boris. Okay, next problem. Three or four learners tend to talk in Russian if they are asked to do a group work or a pair work exercise. Thank you. Well, here we could see that they are like organizational problems or individual problems. Like both of them at the same time. Uh, Vova is very shy and won't say anything unless asked directly. What kind of problem is that? Thank you. This is an individual problem. Some learners have a problem with word stress and they are difficult to understand when they speak English. What kind of problem is that? Thank you. Oh, that's a linguistic problem. All right, now coming back to the problems again. So the first problem was the learners already know will and may overuse this. Can you recommend or can you give any solution, a possible solution to this problem? For example, if necessary, I will use a short discrimination exercise contrasting will and going to, or maybe some other ways of talking about future, right? This way you could try to like avoid this problem. Well, let's get some practice. This is the second 
problem. Would you please suggest a solution to this problem? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Well, um, my recommendation, and this is a typical recommendation people get from CELTA, uh, is to use one group of three people. So instead of a pair, you just put three people together and they do the job as a three. Uh, it's not really advisable to join or like an individual student to form a pair yourself because this would deprive you of an opportunity to be overlooking the class, you know, and it would be difficult to, to gain control of what's going on. So it's better to place three people in a group of like in a pair, in the virtual pair, so to say. Okay. Well, here we have this strong, uh, enthusiastic student. Your ideas, how can we solve that? Thank you very much. Well, my idea is that the teacher could just nominate the other candidates, the other people to talk, you know, thus uh, manipulating the situation. Okay, one more problem. Your idea, please. Thank you. Well, um, there are a number of ways you can do this. For example, if you have like a multinational class, you can just jumble the students, mingle the students more, or you could like try to form a multinational class if it is possible. If it's a monolingual group, uh, just, just try to avoid putting these particular guys together. Uh, you could also try to introduce some sort of rules about when we use Russian language and when we do not use the Russian language. Um, some, maybe sometimes just not, not letting these activities go on for a very long time would help because quite often students switch to Russian when they are when they have nothing to do. They have completed the exercise quickly and then they're just you know chatting um or maybe just giving clear instructions would be kind of suitable it sounds strange but really quite often it works if you you know limit somehow your students and audibly limit your students on their use of uh, russian language it, it could really work especially with the grown-ups okay this shy student your ideas Thank you. Uh, again, nomination could work here. You can just uh, nominate the student uh, whenever you want him to, to answer. Uh, and also you could use structured pair work uh, where the student uh, can express himself, but he or she doesn't do it on the spot, like when everyone is looking at him or her. So a pair activity, a pair communication activity is a very good way to like promote your student conversational skills. At the same time, not exposing your students to like, you know, to be seen by everybody. Okay, and one more problem, your ideas. Thank you. Well, uh, Probably the best idea would be just to, to do some stress drilling before going on to the like freer speaking activity, just to remind your students about the stress or to do some practice with that before they can actually delve into, you know, freeway conversation. All right. Now, a little bit of reflection. Well, uh, you will see a number of teachers uh, sharing their concept of planning lessons, you know, their ideas on planning lessons. I would like you to have a look at all of these teachers and then in the end, tell me which teacher are you mostly like at the moment and why? Okay, let's look at this sample teachers. Karina, take a look at Karina's idea of planning. You can try to remember or you can just, you know, come back to this uh, place to see it in details again. Well, the next one is Kaylee, probably this is how I say this name correctly. Okay, have a look at this. You can pause 
if you want to, if you need time to read. Okay, this is Maria. Richard. And Tom. Okay, all of them. Uh, so who are you mostly like at the moment and why? Thank you. Well, I guess we've just come to the end of the story for today. Thanks a lot. I hope it was not tedious. I hope, I hope you have gone through everything. All right. And uh, see you in a week's time.